Hey everybody, in this video I'm going to show you how to replace the sacrificial anode rod in a water heater. Now my water heater happens to be a Bradford White and their anode rods are done a little differently than the way that most anode rods are done. So I'll go over the differences with how Bradford White is a little bit unique and I'll also cover how you would do this for a different style of water heater where the anode rod is in a different place. Now there are a couple of things you might have to be a little bit of a detective about. Specifically, the model number for your heater will determine the length of your anode rod and the material that it came with from the factory. And if you want to replace it with an exact match, you'll need to find that model number. Mine is on this tag right here on the side of my heater. Jot that down and hit up Google. You should be able to find a parts list complete with replacement part numbers that you can use to order a new anode rod online. Now I can already hear some of you screaming at your device that you're watching this video on. Why are you ordering these on the internet? You can pick them up locally at a plumbing supply store or even at a big box uh, place like Lowe's or Home Depot. Well the answer is, depending on your heater, you might be able to get one that's going to work. But this is the specific replacement rod for my heater. And as you can see, it's got a nipple on the end. And then down here it's got holes that the hot water actually exits the tank through. The water goes into this hole and out the nipple to the house. And then the anode is attached to the bottom of this uh, whole assembly up here. These are not carried in the local big box stores at all. Not only that, my particular heater came with a magnesium rod, not aluminum. And I'll get into the differences in just a few minutes. But I wanted to make sure I was getting the correct replacement type. This rod cost me 25 bucks shipped and it took about a week to get to me. Okay, before I get into the actual process of replacing the rod in that tank, let's talk about anode rods and why they're important. I've got three different types of anodes here. One is made of magnesium, the other two are made of aluminum. So what does an anode rod do? Well, the water that comes into your water heater is not pure water. It has minerals dissolved in it, which will attack the metals inside your water heater. Water heater tanks are made of steel. Now they do have a coating of kind of a ceramic or like a glass on the inside, but that coating is very thin and quite fragile. And that coating will break down over time. And as soon as it does, the uh, minerals and deposits that are in the water will attack that and begin to corrode it and rust it and eat through it. And then your water heater tank springs a leak and you have to replace the entire heater. So the anode rod is there because these types of metals that the anodes are made of attract the ions in the water more readily than the steel will once that ceramic coating has been broken down. I know that's a little complex, but suffice it to say there's an electrochemical response happening inside of your water heater tank all of the time. There are minerals dissolved in the water which will attack the anode instead of attacking the steel. Even if your uh, glass or ceramic interior coating has broken down, they will be attracted to the anode more readily than they will be attracted to the steel of the tank. And as a result, they eat away the, the metal of the anode, which is easy to replace, and your tank lasts a lot longer. So let's talk about the types of metals. This one, which is the one I'm gonna be putting into my tank today, is magnesium. These other two are aluminum. They make them out of uh, several other alloys as well. Depending on what kind of water you have coming into your house, you may need to think about whether you use magnesium or an aluminum or some other alloy. In particular, if you have a water softener, the recommendation is to use magnesium because the sodium ions will attack magnesium far easier than they attack aluminum. So if your water heater originally came with an aluminum rod and you have a softener, you should replace it with a magnesium rod. In my case, my heater did come with magnesium and I'm just replacing it with the exact same thing. Um, it's a perfect fit already because I do have a water softener. Now you also may have noticed that these are slightly different shapes. This one has these little cutouts here, whereas this one is just a solid piece of aluminum. The reason for that is because water heaters are sometimes installed in areas that don't have very much headroom up above the heater. And as a result, you wouldn't really be able to get a rod that's, you know, three and a half or four feet long up above your water heater. So they make this kind that can flex and bend. These little junctions right here, you can bend these rods really quite easily so that you can bend them around the corner and then straighten them back out again so that they wind up going kind of straight down into your tank without touching the sides. 
So I just wanted to illustrate the different types of rods so you'd know what to be looking for when you're shopping for your anode rod. So this replacement rod came with a sticker wrapped around it and I don't want that sticker to flake off and settle to the bottom of my tank and eventually potentially get sucked up into my plumbing and clog something. So I'm gonna clean it off. So the first thing we need to do is to turn off the heat source. Now on this heater, it's a gas one, so we need to just spin this dial over to the pilot setting. If your heater doesn't have a pilot, perhaps it has a vacation setting, or if your heater is electric, instead of turning the temperature control, it's far easier just to turn it off either at your circuit breaker or by unplugging it from the wall. But in this particular one, I'm just gonna twist this dial until we get to the pilot setting. You hear the burner just turned off, it won't turn the burner back on, but it'll leave the pilot light lit so that when I'm finished with this job, I just twist that back to my desired temperature and it'll turn right back on. So the next step is to locate the cutoff valve on your cold water supply for your heater. Mine happens to be that ball valve right there. This is up on top of my water heater tank. And to turn it off, you just twist that ball valve a quarter turn so that the handle is perpendicular to the direction of the pipe. All right, next you'll come and open a hot water tap at one of your faucets. You'll notice that water will continue to flow for a few seconds. It'll taper off and eventually stop as the pressure is relieved in the system. Now the next step is to attach a hose to my drain valve. Now you may wonder where this drain valve came from. It's huge and it probably doesn't look anything like the drain valve on your heater. This is the valve that came with my heater originally, and I recently replaced it with this drain valve, which is much larger and much more robust and far easier to use. If you're interested in seeing how I did that, you can check the link that just appeared up at the top of the screen there. In the meantime, let's just go ahead and open this up. We'll attach our garden hose. So make sure the other end of this hose is either at a floor drain that should be near the installation of your water heater or running outside of your house. Uh, I'm in a garage and so I've just run this out onto my driveway. Now I'm not going to drain the entire tank, I'm only going to drain a couple of gallons off. So we'll go ahead and open up this drain valve. And you can hear the tank has started to drain. And I'm just going to let it drain for maybe a minute or two. I'll go out onto the driveway, see how much water's come out. All we're really trying to do is get the water level to go from the very top of the tank down just a little bit so that we don't have water pouring out of the top when we take that anode rod out. Okay, I've drained just a couple of gallons off the tank. That will drop the water level at the top of the tank down just a little bit. So we can close this valve back up and should be able to remove the garden hose. Put our cap back on here. And now we'll move up to the top of the tank to get to where the anode rod is. This is my cold water in, this is my hot water out. And the anode is attached right here to this nipple on the hot water out right here in this little guy. So to get to that, I'm gonna need to remove this chimney, I think, because I don't have enough room to swing a wrench. I've got a furnace right here in the way. So I've just got these four little sheet metal screws around there. I'll pop those off and move the chimney out of the way a little bit, being careful not to change the shape of the tube too much. I just need to get it out of the way so I can swing the wrench better. All right, we are ready to detach the hot that goes out to the house. Now this is where Bradford White differs from most other manufacturers. Most manufacturers will have a second location off to the side here where you'll see a hex head just sticking out of the top of the water heater or perhaps it's under a little plug. For those water heaters, you don't need to remove this at all. This is again specific to water heaters that use this nipple type of anode. So make sure you've checked your owner's manual that you've identified and you're certain that the thing you're about to unscrew is in fact the anode. Otherwise you might be in for a bad time. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can crack this open with just a pair of pliers or if we'll have to get a little more aggressive with a pipe wrench. Okay, this is quite loose. The type of fitting it is, is the kind that typically you wouldn't want to crank down super tight anyway. Okay, we'll go ahead and pull that out, bend it out of the way. Hey, future me here with a quick digression and word of caution. The tops of these anodes are installed such that really the only part that's exposed are the threads of the fitting. Now on mine, I had a very small little section of the pipe that I could grip with my pipe wrench, 
But as you'll see here in just a second, I went to my brother's house to try and help him with his, and well, here's what happened. All right, well, as is commonly the situation, when you do something yourself that you don't really know exactly what you're doing, sometimes you run into problems. Now, I have successfully swapped out the anode rod on one of these heaters, and it worked just great. But on this one, my brother's heater, only the threads of the top of the anode rod were visible, and when I started cranking on them with my pipe wrench, it just collapsed the threads, and I couldn't get any grip on the pipe. So now we're um, faced with the unfortunate situation where he's got no hot water in his house, and it's my fault. So we decided rather than trying to go just a little bit crazier and getting this thing out no matter what, to play the better safe than sorry card. And so I went and grabbed some fittings from the hardware store that I could use to restore his threads. What I'm doing here is just threading that on and then back off several times. And it actually did a pretty good job. The threads weren't perfect, but they were good enough that after I put on some Teflon tape and also a little bit of pipe dope, I was able to put his hot water fitting back on and there were no leaks, everything was fine, restored back to exactly the way that it was. So just be aware going in that the way that these are constructed with just a little bit of those threads exposed at the top, you may not be able to get a good enough grip to get that old anode out. Now back to the regularly scheduled video where I was able to get the anode out. All right, this is the anode that we're gonna be replacing. So let's see if I can get it with pliers. Probably I can't. Nope, not even close. Let me grab a pipe wrench. All right, so I've got a fairly large, I think this is an 18 inch pipe wrench here. And we'll try this, see if we can get a good enough bite on there to get it out. If I can't do it with this, then I've got a cheater bar I can add to the pipe wrench. All right, here we go. There, it comes right off. Now, it's important to note here that this is in here really tight, which is part of the reason why I wanted to make sure that I didn't empty all of the water out of the tank. You need the weight of that water in the tank to hold the tank down while you try and spin this anode rod out. Okay, that's loose enough. I should be able to thread it out the rest of the way myself now. Okay, let's see if I can spin this off with my hand. I can. Okay, the anode is completely free. Let's lift it out and see how it looks. Now, this is not all that corroded. And I may not have enough ceiling space. Oh, I just barely do. Now, if I didn't have enough ceiling space, the only way to really get these out is to cut them with a hacksaw as you pull them out. All right, let's take a closer look at this anode that I've just pulled out. You can see it's the one on the top. And while it is beginning to corrode, it's really not all that bad. If we zoom in just a little bit here, you can see it's a little pitted and it's certainly discolored but there is quite a bit of life left on this particular anode. So if you pull yours out and it looks like this, you're actually good to just put it right back in the tank and leave it there. You've probably got at least another couple of years of life on that. Now in my case, I'm gonna go ahead and replace it simply because I wanna demonstrate the correct process for doing it. I just wanted to point out that if you pull yours out and it looks like this, you're in pretty good shape. A couple of things I noticed that are different between the one installed by the factory and the replacement. The first is this upper part. They've given me a little bit longer area at the top there. So I believe that's because when I install it, that will help prevent me from damaging the threads with the pipe wrench when I crank it back down on there. And I think that's a great thing because I don't want those threads to get chewed up. One other thing to note, this is the anode that I just pulled out, and you can see there's a little valve of some kind that's in the top there. That's called a heat trap. And I figure while I'm in here replacing the anode, I may as well replace the heat trap as well. This part, uh, it only cost, I think, $4, maybe 5 And I ordered it the same time I did the replacement anode. This is the replacement heat trap. And it just fits right down inside the new anode, just like that. 
One more thing I've just noticed, these are different lengths. The one that came from the factory, you can see is about four or five inches shorter. I've got their tops lined up perfectly, but down at the other end, you can see the one that was in there is quite a bit shorter than the other one. Also of note is if you look at the one that was installed at the factory, it's been cut a little short. You can tell because you can see the core there that uh, the magnesium is adhering to. Whereas on the replacement that they sent me, you can't see that core. So I think I'm gonna play the better safe than sorry card and go ahead and just use a hacksaw and cut the replacement to be exactly the same length. Because the last thing I wanna do is thread this thing in, wind up having it be a little too long and have it damage the bottom of my tank. Now it bears mentioning that magnesium is a flammable material. It will burn if you get it hot enough. So I'm gonna cut this by hand rather than with one of my chop saws because while it's probably perfectly safe to cut with a chop saw, I've never tried to cut magnesium with a chop saw. Frankly, I don't want my garage to burn down. It's a really soft metal though, as you can see. This hacksaw is just going right through it. Okay, I'm just about ready to install the new anode, but first I need to add a little bit more joint compound here to make sure that this is gonna seal properly. Now, I know that there's a little bit of a holy war here with whether or not you should use Teflon tape or pipe dope or both. And in my previous video all about uh, replacing your drain valve, I went into the details of exactly why I'm gonna use both. So you can go check that out and have the holy flame war in the comments section there. So for now though, I'm gonna go ahead and put some uh, Teflon tape. I will wanna point out though, I've seen a lot of tutorials of how to put these rods into your water heater and almost every single one of them puts the tape on backwards. When you're threading this into the fitting, it's gonna be threaded this direction. So you wanna wrap the tape around this same direction so that you wind up having the tape get tighter into the joint, not being undone in the joint as you are tightening it into the fitting. So my rule of thumb for doing this is I have to think pretty hard about which direction am I gonna be turning this. So I'm gonna be turning it this way, which means I want the tape to go on like this. So that as I'm turning it this way into the fitting, I'm just gonna get the tape tighter. Now, you know that you've done it right because if you hold your fingers on the threads and give it a little pressure and spin, the tape should not come off. If you've done it backwards, the tape will actually peel right off and crumble in your hands. And I gave an example in that other video that I linked to just a little bit ago. You can go check that out if you wanna see it. So with some tape on there, we'll go ahead and apply a little bit of pipe dope as well. And then we're ready to install. So as I mentioned when I was discussing the different types of these anodes, you may not have enough room up above your heater to get your anode in. And if that's the case, you will need to get one of those segmented ones. I barely have enough room so I can thread it down and drop it down into the tank like that. Now, one word of caution here there is a bunch of water in this tank that's gonna fight you as you put this in, and it's gonna make the whole thing sway one way or the other. The anode should go straight down into the tank. You don't want it to go crooked. You don't want it to touch the side. So make sure that it's going in straight. Yeah, I can feel it. Hopefully you can see from this angle just how much, if I let go of that, see how the pipe's moving back and forth? It's subtle but it's definitely doing it. It's fighting the current of the water. There we go. So if you turn it backwards with some down pressure, you'll feel when the threads line up, it'll give you a little thunk when you'll feel it go down. So then you can start going forward again and you'll know you're not cross-threading. 
Well, it's about as tight as I can get it by hand. So we'll go to some mildly stronger pliers. Being careful to grip it on the smooth part of the pipe there. You don't want to damage the threads. Now we are going to go ahead and crank it down more with the pipe wrench. And again, I'm making sure the pipe wrench is as low down on the pipe as I can make it. Try not to touch these threads, you don't want to strip them. This is requiring a fair bit of force, but it is going in nice and smooth. I don't have any indication that I'm cross-threading anything. Since I can only turn it about an eighth of a turn, each time I grab it with the wrench, just have to be patient. And wait till it's all the way seated. Okay, I think we're in all the way. So now we can put the outlet to the house back on. Same thing applies, you don't want to cross thread this, start it by hand. And then once you snug it down by hand, grab a pair of pliers or a crescent wrench. You really don't need to put too much force on these. Probably that's about it, about three quarters of a turn extra. All right. Now before I replace this vent hood for the, uh, for the chimney, I'm gonna go ahead and repressurize the system and check for leaks. I just grabbed my valve here. Let's give it a turn. Nope, oh, we're leaking. So pretty quickly after I did that, I noticed some leaking right around this. Let's see if I can catch that on camera a little better. Go ahead and pressurize it again. You can see there's some little bit of bubbling. This was maybe just not quite tight enough. Oops. Let's get it a little tighter. Okay, we'll open that valve again and see if we have any leaks. I don't see or feel any leaks there now. Let me grab a towel to wipe it off so we can see that it's dry. I'm gonna go close that faucet so we get full pressure at that joint and make sure nothing's leaking. I do not see or hear any leaks at all anymore. So we should be able to put the chimney back on and this job's finished up. So replacing your anode rod is not a really difficult job. The hardest part is probably finding the correct anode in the first place. Again, refer to your owner's manual, get a parts list from the manufacturer, and either purchase the correct part from a local plumbing supply or order it online if you have to. And then uh, getting the old one out can require a little bit of elbow grease. If you don't already have a fairly large pipe wrench like this one, you can pick these up at Harbor Freight in the US or I think it's called Princess Auto in Canada uh, for I think I paid $8 for this and it worked just great. Did the job like a charm. This is the Air 18 inch. They got a bunch of different sizes. Uh, 18 gave me plenty of leverage. Now if you find a pipe wrench doesn't give you enough leverage and you still can't get that thing to break free, then you may have to use a cheater bar like this. This is just an old piece of iron pipe. I actually got this at a hardware store out of their scrap bin. Um, I think they charged me $6 for it. That was a great deal on that as well. Uh, but basically you put your wrench on the top of the fitting, slide that in and now your wrench is suddenly four feet long instead of 18 inches. Do exercise some caution though. You don't want to break the top of that fitting off then you're gonna have a much bigger problem to try and deal with. So be gentle, be slow, be deliberate, and be careful. You shouldn't have any trouble at all. All right, well, that's about gonna do it for this one. I hope you've enjoyed this video and maybe even learned a little something. The Bradford Whites are a little unique in the way that they do their anode rods, but it's not all that difficult. If you did enjoy what you've seen or you wanna see more, then hit that like button and uh, think about clicking that subscribe button as well. I'd sure appreciate it, but you know, there's no pressure. And as always, Thank you very much for watching.